All right, peeps, on today's episode of the Kung Fu Genius, the genius will be answering all sorts of hot nonsense from Patreon. Lots of gems, lots of Chan Chi Man, and lots of... Did you know that Ding Hao dropped three places on the Hong Kong airport Wing Chun Kung Fu leaderboard? Let's get to it. And every day, I practice martial arts. Watch out! Yo, Mikey, how you doing, man? I'm doing all right, Seagong. Yeah, you uh, you look a little uh, look a little worn down. You're like you've been working extra hours, getting ready for Hong Kong or something like that. Yeah, let's go with that. Okay, we'll go with that. <laughs> yes, we'll, let's go exactly with that. See, I've been working extra hours. I've been doing liver workouts. Liver? Oh, liver workouts. Yeah, yeah understood. Yeah, understood. Yes. Wow. And also working like actually like a job. But yeah, like I mean, right. I'm 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 ready. I am ready for this. I Got am it. So ready for yes, this. Yes, oh my yes, yes. It's it's been a yeah. It's been a pretty intense last few months. It'll be great to uh, have a little bit of a vacation to go back to Hong Kong after so many years. And mm-hmm. the uh, the trip is now week by week. Uh, the people that we're going to be meeting and the things that we're going to be doing just gets even crazier. So I'm so excited about this trip to Hong Kong. Uh, so before we get started, just want to remind everyone that the best way to support The Kung Fu Genius is on Patreon. Patreon.com slash The Kung Fu Genius. The link for that is in the description below. For as little as $5 a month, you can get access to your favorite Kung Fu podcast a few days early every week. On top of that, there's a lot of little extra goodies that we give to our Patreons and higher tiers of support have all sorts of other goodies including a private one-on-one episode with yours truly Uh, in addition to that my instagram subscriber reels where i teach wing chun tips uh about every week on instagram automatically get uploaded to patreon as well so if you don't uh have your subscription to me on instagram you can just go to patreon and you get uh all of that included so patreon.com slash the kung fu genius that's the best way to support us because YouTube revenue is barely peanuts. Yeah. I think YouTube revenue barely covers the fees for the YouTube revenue. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's about right. Really, yeah, yep, yep. Yeah. And, uh, and also what, what, uh, one thing you learn when you look at the uh, ad revenue on YouTube is that it's seasonal. Right. So like at the beginning of the year, the ad rates go down and you get like peanuts and then like it goes up a little bit and then it goes down. We also haven't done too many lives, so we haven't had a chance to get like super chats and things like that. So I'm really the easiest way to support us is on Patreon. By the way, when we're in Hong Kong, we're definitely going to try to record at least one, yep. if not maybe two episodes of the Kung Fu Genius. Two, yeah. And maybe some interviews, some special stuff, some mm-hmm. and on top of that. Uh, uh, our good friend and student and my photographer, Brendan, is coming to Hong Kong. Oh, this is super exciting. So we're going to have a photographer there to help us with content and shooting stuff. So uh, for uh, followers of the podcast, as well as those of you who follow me on Instagram, at the Kung Fu Genius, uh, lots of new stuff and content coming your way. So super excited about that. Yeah, this, is, this T-shirt's for you, Brendan, by the way. I know you kind of, look. check it out. You know you want a piece of this. So. <laughs> those who are listening to us on audio are like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, before we get started, uh, we have made a slight change to the format of the podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, one thing is we're going to do more topical episodes, like Hong Kong stories or like, uh, my favorite episode we've done was the Bruce Lee versus Bruce Lee. Oh, we've got yeah, a that was great fantastic. reception to that. People really like that. And I really quite enjoy doing that kind of stuff. I like talking about one thing in detail, even if it's something ridiculous, like which Bruce Lee character would hypothetically win if they all fought each other, uh, or something a little meatier, like uh, talking about the Grandmaster Yip Man or Wing Chun or something like that. Uh, so I think we're going to do more topic episodes, single topic episodes moving forward. We will stu- still do one to two AMAs, Ask Me Anythings, a month, but uh, we're only going to take questions from our Patreon supporters uh, because, you know, they're they're the ones who are supporting us. They're the ones that, you know, we really want to make sure that they get heard and they get their questions answered. Uh, however, all of our fantastic followers on YouTube can still suggest topic ideas in the comments so you guys can uh you know in the comments if you want us to review a movie like we're definitely going to be doing new york ninja at some point right Mm -hmm. and i really i really want to go and do some canon movies you know i I would like to do some so we like just we sit down and watch revenge of the ninja yes all right we watch it we review it we dissect it 
uh, you know, even blood sport, all that kind of stuff, right? Ninja was, 3, the domination. Ninja 3, the domination is yes. amazing. And I know we did a ninja episode. It's mm-hmm. one of my favorite episodes. It's also one of our least watched episodes. But it's also very early on, and I think we have gotten a lot of new podcast listeners who maybe haven't gone back and listened to that old content. Um, so I think we could like literally do another episode on all of those ninja movies I talked about. And I think most of our audience did not hear it the first time, Mm -hmm. but we can do it. I would love to do a deep dive, perhaps the deepest dive, dive so deeply that no one has ever dove in, (laughs) dove, (laughs) dove into Ninja three, the domination starring the ultra hot Lucinda Dickey. All right. Yes. And uh, James Hong yes. is in it too. Of course. Yes. Yep. The movie, and of course, Show Kasugi, right? Yeah. Oh, the movie's absolutely. amazing. Yep. So we can go into that because it's a ninja movie that has possession, exorcisms, demons, and of course, martial arts. Oh, yes. And it's got the most insane opening scene ever. <laughs> no, it's just amazing. like nothing but gratuitous violence. For th- I remember <laughs> watching that as a kid. I think Ninja 3 The Domination was actually the first ninja movie I ever saw. Oh, wow. My dad got, he rented it for me because, of course, my dad is German, right? So uh, he wasn't like, he didn't really care too much about violence. Like, he didn't think that was a bad thing for me to watch. And he certainly didn't care about me seeing boobies when I was younger because he was German. Mm. Like, boobies was a normal thing. So he would, like, look at the back of the movies like, nudity, fine, my son can watch that, no problem, right? (laughs) So he rents me Ninja 3 The Domination, right? And I remember watching that. And the opening scene where he's just killing everyone uh, on that golf course. And it's like so crazy. And I watched it, I think, last year. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is still awesome. This is still awesome. It's so fantastic. So we definitely need to do like a Ninja 3 of the Domination episode. And then we can go back to my other favorite ninja movie, which is Revenge of the Ninja, mm-hmm. which is just a gratuitous, it's just ninja porn from beginning to end. It's great. It's okay. amazing. Well, we've got to watch Pray for Death as well. I would love to watch Pray for Death because I watched Pray for Death once, like back in 88, 89 when it came out. Mm-hmm. I just remember the metal ninja mask. And I remember like, I think he had like a chain mail, like a ninja, like uh, under his ninja suit, right? Or he had mm-hmm. like chain mail under the metal mask. It was like a chain mail ninja mask. And he had the star on the top. Like, that's awesome. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we definitely got to watch that. I think oh, that's yeah. going to be amazing. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we'll definitely do that. So, but for moving forward, all the AMAs are going to be just from Patreon supporters. But uh, we still really appreciate all the input from our YouTube supporters. So, In the comments, there's a movie you want us to review, there's a topic you want us to do, or maybe you think that Mikey and I got the Bruce Lee versus Bruce Lee thing all wrong and you want to like, (laughs) want us to revisit. Some people actually said uh, uh, they want us, well, what about like Bruce Lee's TV characters, like Lee Chung from Long Street? But I'm thinking like there's TV world and there's movie world, the universe. And I'm like, no way any of the TV guys, Green Hornet or Long Street, like, any of those characters can beat any of the movie characters, right? Yeah. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so today we are going to have our first AMA, which is officially now Patreon only. So uh, what you got for me, Mikey? So what if you could transport back in time for a front row seat into the life and legacy of one of the most respected Wing Chun masters in history? Gong Sao Wong, a tribute. Direct students on Sifu Wong Sao Leung offers you just that. Through a series of exclusive conversations, 25 direct students share anecdotes, reflections, and personal stories offering in-depth understanding of the man behind the legend. Order your copy today across 12 Amazon marketplaces with free shipping. I absolutely love this book, and I think you'll find it an indispensable part of your collection. I can't recommend it enough. Get yours today. Go to Amazon, type in Gong Sao Wong, and there you go. All right. So, what I have for you, Seagong. First question from Bradley K. Faulkner. All right. Hello, Alex Sifu. The time you spent with Chan Chi Man was obviously a great blessing. Did you ever touch hands with him, and was his power obvious? Respectfully, Bradley Faulkner. Yes, that's a great question, because I, mm. I love any excuse to talk about the late Chan Sifu, right? Uh, I, I really, uh, it was interesting today, I was actually teaching um, my assistant Craig, uh, we were going over the Batam Do, right? And the Batam Do, the knives are something that have evolved over time, because if we really look at them in detail, and we, and, and, and we look back at the history or what we can know of the history, which is actually very little, it seems pretty obvious that 
Grandmaster Yip Man was most likely the originator of the bat cham, though, because there, there is no n knife fighting technique in Fatsan uh, th that is called bat cham, though. It's a very specific name, the eight slashing or eight chopping knives. Uh, some other Wing Chun systems, like Yun Kei San, they use what's called Seung Do, which just means double knives. So even in the other Wing Chun lineages that are separate from Yip Man, if they have knives, it's not called Ba Cham Do. They might have Lok Di Bun Guan because that's a common long pole form that's shared by multiple styles, not just Wing Chun. But Ba Cham Do is like a very specific name and the only place you see it is in Yip Man Wing Chun and in particular in Hong Kong Yip Man Wing Chun. So uh, it seems that Grandmaster Yip Man, even in his new Marshall Hero Magazine interview, the second one, he actually said um, very plainly that the knife fighting technique is derived from the hand techniques. So in other words, it's not like the long pole. The long pole is not derived from Wing Chun fist fighting techniques. The long pole is its own style. It was incorporated into Wing Chun, and what Wing Chun did was add some of its own ideas, like Pun Guan, some of the Chi Sao ideas in there, which you don't find in Lok Tim Pun Guan outside of Wing Chun. So we, we kind of took it and we made it our own, but the Ba Cham, though, is different. It's not a foreign knife form that was introduced into Wing Chun uh, and then adapted. It seems like it was a endogenous, homegrown style of knife fighting because uh, it has, in many respects, some of the same ideas of the uh, Wing Chun fist fighting techniques, some simultaneous action, some based on um, aggressive, proactive defense. You're not waiting to block stuff with the knives. You're cutting the person down in mid-stroke as they're coming at you, which is very similar to what we're doing in our fist fighting techniques. So uh, what seems pretty clear is that mm, the late Grandmaster Yip Man had some plausible deniability in terms of his knife techniques. Because one, he didn't teach the knife techniques to that many of his students. He taught it to a handful of students here and there. And oftentimes those were not students who uh, would trade what they had learned uh, from, from the old man. So he could teach these couple guys like the knife form this way. And then a few years down the road, he may have changed a couple of the sets and he teaches those guys this way and never shall the twain meet. And uh, I've had the very lucky privilege to have learned the Chan Chi Man style of double knives. I didn't learn it directly from, so it's interesting. I learned it from my Sibat, Leon Tim, who learned it from Chan Chi Man. And Leon Tim introduced me to Chan Chi Man, and then I became friends with Chan Chi Man. So I had learned Chan Chi Man's knife techniques, but not from him, but then became his friend later on, and had the chance to talk to him about the knife and, and how he learned it from Grandmaster Yip Man. And what seems painfully clear, because I've taught the Chan Chi Man version of the knives to some of my senior students, and then have started to teach them the Leung Ting version of the knives. And uh, Leung Ting's knives are essentially represent the, the very final period of Yip Man's teaching. And the Chan Chi Man version of the knives, in, in my estimation, is one of the earliest versions of the knife form that he taught. Mm. And what you very clearly see is a through line that Grandmaster Yip Man had you know, come up with this idea of the knives and the sets and how we arrange them. And then we have the early version of it, and then now through the Leung Tang system, a very late version of it. And then when I see students, for example, from the Ho Ka Ming lineage, which is smack dab middle period, like Chen Chi Man is early period, Leung Tang is very late period, Ho Ka Ming is middle period. The knife form that, for example, Ho Ka Ming does, or in many respects, Mo Yat, although he has some differences in there that are different from both versions. But what I see with the middle period version is that it looks just like, it's like evolution. It is on a spectrum. It's exactly between the two knife forms. Oh wow! It still has some characteristics of the earlier one, but then also moving away in certain areas that then later are present in the Leung Ting knife form. So it seems clear to me, it could be my own confirmation bias. It could just be my own limited understanding. I'm not saying that this is like gospel truth. I'm just saying that having learned a very qualified version of the early period of knives and having learned like one of the L latest period of the knives, um, 
it seems like he was kind of tinkering with it over time. And uh, today, I, I remember I was teaching the fifth set to, uh, to your Sivu, uh -huh. and uh, we were going over it, uh, and I said, just look at how we do the fifth set in the Leung Ting system, and then now look at the Chan Chi Man version. And when we put them side by side, while they had some kind of market differences in the stance and stuff, it looks like this was an idea, and then the idea later became this. You see the through line in there. And uh, so that understanding, I have to like really credit Chan Chi Man with, because if he wasn't so open with what he would tell me about how he learned from Grandmaster Yip Man and what he learned and what it was like back then and his time meeting Bruce Lee and knowing William Chung and all the stuff that was going on then, um, I think my, my context in understanding how Wing Chun developed from the early 50s to what it later became really wouldn't be there. Uh, since 2015, every year when I went to Hong Kong, so 2015, 16, 17, 18, I went twice in 18 and once in 19. So yeah, about five times. Every time I went there, I would meet with Chan Sivu and either go to his house or meet him for food or both. And on a few trips, I brought my students, Dre, Arnell, they were there on that last trip. And we went into his house and he would just sit and he would just tell us these stories. And um, it was amazing how open and warm he was in his, in his knowledge and his stories. And he was always so nice and complimentary to my students and to me. And I'll, I'll always appreciate that because to be quite honest, um, I come from a very large Wing Chun family, all right? The mm -hmm. Leung Ting system is one of the largest of all the Wing Chun lineages in terms of numbers. And so you have a huge European following in Hong Kong, especially in the 70s and 80s, it was really big. I have lots of Kung Fu uncles. I have lots of, you know, senior uncles, junior uncles, you know, Si Zok Kong, Si Bak Kong, all, all, all over the place, Si Hangs and everything. And I have really close memories and or I have really have people who are very close to in my family. But I have to say, Chan Sifu is not my Sifu. You know, we're all from the Yip Man Wing Chun, but I'm not directly from Chan Sifu's line. I have to say, he was probably more welcoming, more open, more nice than many of the people in my own Kung Fu family, to be quite honest. Right. Um, and he had, in many respects, much more heart and much more humanity than people that I kind of bow and call them, you know, by some Kung Fu familial term. And he, uh, and he didn't have to be that way. I was kind of n nobody to him and he really accepted me with open arms. And so um, to answer the question that uh, Bradley asked, yeah, I, I actually did touch hands with him twice. Um, and uh, in, it, usually very informally in uh, Chan Sifu's house, right? So we'd be sitting there and he would be telling me like, oh, uh, his, his thing he would always say about uh, Grandmaster Yip Man is, uh, oh, uh, you know, he was very cheeky, you know, to, to borrow one of, <laughs> one, of, one of your country slang, right? That's cheeky, a, right? Cheeky. And, uh, and he would usually say uh, Yip Man was cheeky in kind of two, two contexts. He would say that uh, sometimes when he would walk down the street with Grandmaster Yip Man, uh, especially at that time in Sam Soi Bo in the 50s. Hong Kong is, was not quite the same like you're going to see in a few weeks. Even Sam Soi Bo, that area, is full of lights, it's bustling, it's, and, and, but in the 50s, it was very dark. He had, he had to hold a lantern, and then he would hold Yip Man's arm, and they would walk down the street because it didn't have all the lights and, and stuff that you see now. And he said occasionally when they would walk down the street, uh, especially in the morning, in the daytime, Yip Man would kind of walk uh, next to him, and then Yip Man would like, throw an attack at him randomly, <laughs> right? Like, uh, and usually they were Choi Lei Fat attacks because Choi Lei Fat was one of the predominant Kung Fu styles in Hong Kong. And Choi Lei Fat represents, to a certain degree, the exact opposite theory of Wing Chun. Wing Chun being about that direct, linear, straight line and Choi Lei Fat being more about the, you know, the very powerful curved line, right? So it's kind of the, the dueling theories, you know, what is better in fighting, the direct straight punch or like the really powerful winding uh, um, round punch, right? So Yip Man wanted his students to be like well-equipped against these things. So he would like kind of bust a couple Choi Lei Fat shapes at, at Chan Chi Man. Chan Chi Man like would be walking and suddenly have to, you know, defend himself or defend or parry one or two movements. And that was usually the first case of Yip Man being cheeky. 
Uh, and he said it was very funny because because he was an older man. I mean, think about it. At that time, Yeet Man was in his late 50s, early 60s. Yeah. And there he is walking down the street, like, like kind of like one of the guys, like throw, throwing a couple punches. I don't know, you got to defend it or whatever, right? And then, uh, and then the other time he would say he was cheeky was in a couple little cheese out tricks. So, uh, and uh, he showed me the same trick twice on both occasions. I think he had forgotten that he had shown me before because it was like a year between uh, visits and we were sitting there and he goes, ah, uh, you know, my Sivu, he was very cheeky. And then he just grabbed my hands and then he just stood up with me and we started doing Pun Sao or Lok Sao, the, the, the cheese out rolling. And Chan Sivu had a very uh, uh, kind of power heavy style. If you ever watch videos of him doing it, he, there are a couple of videos of him on YouTube doing Chi Sao with Wu Chan Lam. Wu Chan Lam was one of Wong Sun Leung's uh, uh, top students. Uh, Wu Chan Lam was also a, a good fighter. Uh, he also passed away a number of years ago. Uh, and the two of them would do Chi Sao. They were very close friends. And you see, they did like a very kind of forward pressure heavy style of Pun Sao. So I remember the first time I did Chi Sao with uh, uh, Chan Sivu, you know, we just, and it's just, it, it wasn't like a big session. It was just for a, just a few seconds, right? Yeah. And we, we, we start doing that, and he had so much power, right? And so I'm just sticking to him, and then he shows me this, like, indoor tansao attack that Yip Man would do from Pun Sao, and it was very cool. You know, he would go like this, and then most people would try this, boom, and then he would do this, and then he was like, oh, he was so cheeky, and he would show me this trick, and it just, like, <laughs> it, like tickled his heart to show it to me, right? And then about a year later, uh, I was at his house with uh, Antonio, and he kind of basically did the same thing. He was like, oh, and then he grabbed my hands. He showed me the same exact trick again. And he was like, oh, it was so great. And he loved doing this, right? So I, I had really gotten a feeling from the emphasis Chan Zivu placed on that story that this was a thing Yip Man really liked to do. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and it's a trick I've kept for myself, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, I haven't, I, haven't, well, I haven't showed it not out of like, oh, I don't want to teach you guys or whatever. It's just... Uh, it, it just hasn't come up yet. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. I see. This is oh, the, God, boop, right. Yeah, keep yeah. that boop, keep that one right in my pocket, right? Mm -hmm. You've got to earn the right to see it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, um, Tan Sivu, up until his dying days, was still very powerful and still very, uh, you know, very coherent. You know, um, he was in his eighties when he passed away. And I remember going over uh, to his place, and and when we would talk, you know, he spoke English. And he always thought it was funny when I would like speak a little Cantonese to him. And he was like, oh, you are not like a normal Kuailo. <laughs> it's like, that was the thing he always said, right? <laughs> it was so funny. Uh, and uh, because of course the term Kuailo, you know, Kuai meaning ghost or demon or spirit, right? Mm -hmm. And Lo is like guy or dude or whatever. Um, it's one of those terms that um, uh, it, it's only insulting if you say it in an insulting way. Yeah. You know, like if someone looks at you and says, say guaylo, like, you know, F you guaylo, whatever, that's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. but it's like, oh, this is my guaylo buddy over here, right? Yeah. No one's going to get upset, right? Mm -hmm. I had a, an American friend who lived in Hong Kong and he would get so uptight when people would say guaylo, even in the more friendly, casual ways. Like, yeah. Ah. yeah, like, you know, would they think it was funny if I call them this or that? I'm like, dude, calm down, all right? Calm down. You're a white guy living in Hong Kong, all right? If they want to call you ghost bro, all right, and, and you get uppity about it, it's like, calm down, buddy, mm -hmm. all right? And then he, he, and you're like this, he's obviously, he, was, he doesn't live in Hong Kong anymore, um, and he lives in Taiwan now, um, but he, uh, you know, he lived in Hong Kong for well, it was almost about 10 years, and he's very American. He's like, man, the, uh, Hong Kong has not been a British colony since 97, but every day here is British dick-sucking day. <laughs> 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 he's like, yeah, and that's why the Hong Kong Chinese are so like, you know, they snub their noses at the mainland Chinese because, you know, they were once part of this great empire, so they always feel like they're a little bit higher and above or whatever, right? Which um, I'm not going to say is not true. <laughs> There definitely is. I mean, it's a little bit different now. Of course, now they uh, really have no choice but to kind of kowtow to China. But mm -hmm. uh, there is still a little bit of undercurrent. It's like, you know, that's mainland China and we are Hong Kong, mm -hmm. right? We still kept the traditional characters. We still kept the more traditional way of doing things, right? And so th there definitely is that, you know, they definitely look down at mainlanders and stuff like that. Um, but anyway, like the, the idea that he would get so upset, like people would say like Guaylo in a funny way and he'd be like, God, I can't believe they just said that. And I'm like, dude, calm. even if, if a Chinese guy in Hong Kong looked at me and said, say Guaylo, like really like in that angry, I would think I would just laugh. Yeah. Because the thing is, it only insults you if you want it to insult you, you yeah, know? And, and, and so, especially when you're a white guy, it's like, a, 
Am I supposed to get upset? Am I supposed to get angry? Am I supposed mm-hmm. to punch him for calling me something like that? This is funny, whatever, right? Okay, I probably deserved it if he calls me that anyway, right? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so anyway, Tanzeev would sometimes say, like, you know, oh, you're not like a normal Guaylo, but he would say it in a very friendly way. It wasn't like, oh, okay, he's called me Guaylo or something like that, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, so I, I kind of just rolled with him a couple times for a few seconds each. I think, actually, Antonio might have the video of that second time I did it where we just rolled a couple times and then he showed me this trick. It's like five seconds or whatever. And no, I'm not going to upload it on YouTube for you guys. Uh, <laughs> it's part of my personal memories. So, uh, yeah, he was, he was still very powerful until, until his final days. He would get up every morning and he had a routine. And his routine is he would do all the Wing Chun hand forms. He would do the Sunam Tao, he would do the Chum Kyu, he would do the Piuji, he would hit the wooden dummy, and then he would hit the wall bag. And he hit the wall bag exactly the way Grandmaster Yip Man showed him to do it, the, the regular inside punch, the outside punch, and then he would do a couple Phoenix Eye fists on it, and he would do it every day. And he said, uh, and he, he, he said this was essentially the secret to his longevity, is that every day he did all of his forms. Wow. And, um, and even the knife and, every, and the pole, he would literally do it. That was like he did that every day. And, uh, and it was really cool and really inspiring. When I went there, I was thinking like, wow, you know, when I grow up, all right, I want to be Chan Sifu, right? Uh, because, and, and he had so much enjoyment. And what I really appreciated about him is Chan Sifu knew all of the politics. I mean, you can't live in Hong Kong, teach Wing Chun, be a Wing Chun guy and not know what's the beef between this guy or this guy says he learned from him. This guy did this. Da, da, da. You know all that stuff, right? And uh, well, we would have our conversations about that. He wasn't like about that. Yeah. And he and and I have to say that was extremely rare. Mak Sivu, Mak Chi Kong from Hong Kong is another rarity in that case. He also knows where all the bodies are buried in terms of Hong Gar politics. But that's not his main thing. Yeah. He's been the target of other jealous Hong Kong Sivus in Hong Kong. Mak Sivu, he's been unfairly attacked by by uh, 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 people I'm not even gonna name. Um and he's just kind of above it and doesn't care. But yeah. he knows all that stuff. Chen Sifu was the same way. He would tell you like, yeah, well, like, oh, this guy, yeah, watch out for him. And this guy kind of ripped people off with money and da 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 But he wasn't like, Ugh. And he would just go on and continue talking, right? And what's cool is that it was really, it was like Dragnet. It was like just the facts. Yeah. And he was very cool and very calm. And uh, I think he may have at the end, uh, towards the end of his life, he may have regretted not teaching more students. Right because he had uh, just a handful of students in Spain and he had a head student in Spain. And that student actually passed away before Chan Sifu. Oh, wow. And that was like his main guy outside of Hong Kong. And I don't yeah. think he really taught that many people in Hong Kong. So I think, I think he kind of lamented that a little bit. And, and that for me was very bittersweet because that is, the, that is the story of Wing Chun in Hong Kong. You have famous Sifus, Leung Teng, Wong Sun Leung, Choi Sung Teen, all of these guys. But there's some other guys who are just right under the radar, like Chan Sifu, right? That the insiders knew. And these were highly qualified people who would teach Wing Chun without the politics, without all the stuff like that. I'm not saying the other people I named taught it with politics. Um, but I'm just saying, like, but they're all gone now. Yeah. And uh, some of them didn't really teach or leave much records of what they do. And I'm very happy that you know, on my last trip to Hong Kong in 2019, we shot about three to four hours of interview with Chan Sivu, uh, where he, I, I asked him everything, how he started, how he learned from Yip Man, how he learned the Ba Cham Dao, how he learned the wooden dummy, how much did he have to pay, meeting Bruce Lee, what about this guy, was he at Yip Man's funeral? I got everything from him on very clean 4K video, clean audio. We even have him doing like his pole and a dummy and knife. Oh, wow. Um, and, uh, and that was the last time I saw him. And then, you know, he, he passed away during COVID, not because of COVID. He, you know, he just passed away very suddenly and that was it. And, um, you know, I just really implore all the other Wing Chun uh, students out there. If you have a teacher in Hong Kong or you have connection to someone who learned from Yip Man, before it's too late, man, put a camera in front of their face and ask them some questions because it's not happening in Hong Kong. Right. Um, it, it almost angers me how little of a shit the Hong Kong Chinese care about their own culture. They didn't even bother saving Bruce Lee's house. 
every, most historical landmarks in Hong Kong just get run over, turned into a mall. You're going to see, unfortunately, when we're in Hong Kong, I'm going to be like, hey, do you see this mall? That's where Bruce Lee used to live. And now this mall used to be a building, blah, 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 and like this mall used to be, like, it's all malls, right? And it's just, they just, some developer comes in and, okay, that's the next important thing. It's very difficult to preserve anything over there. And uh, the students in Hong Kong, with very rare exceptions, have done a zero to document their own Sifu's Kung Fu. Wow. Hey, how about maybe before your Sifu dies, you ask him if you can film some of his forms. How about you get all of his methods down on paper? How about you ask him if he wrote any notes down when he learned from Yip Man and maybe if you could have copies of that or something? No. And they just squandered it. And the thing that makes me so upset is how much is lost. Right. How much we won't know. All right. Uh, it's gone. All yeah. right. And that doesn't mean that the martial art can still not advance or develop. I mean, we have the Internet. We, we have the ability to develop martial arts because we see what other people are doing. And we need to make sure that our martial art passes muster against other styles. I'm not worried about Wing Chun being able to adapt and get better in the future. But I want to know. <clears throat> but are we starting with everything? that it had to begin with, right? A, a lot of Wing Chun Sifus make claims, oh, they learned everything and they're the most authentic or whatever, but uh, these claims are easily debunked uh, when you actually look at Yip Man's forms in the Tang Sang video, which no one has ever seen. The, 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 I find that most people who say that they have the most authentic long pole form, like Leung Ting, for example, never says he's got the most authentic long pole form, all right? He just says, this is the long pole form, this is how we use it. But then there are people out there like, this is the real traditional Yip Man long pole form. I've seen Yip Man's long pole form. I've seen that the Tang Sang video of Yip Man performing long pole form. And I have to say, the people who beat their fist on the desk the hardest, that their form is the most traditional, their forms are the most unlike Yip Man's <laughs> forms, okay? Where I just have to go, Ugh. and it's not to say their form is not good or they don't know how to use the pole, but it's just that there's always this kind of they, they, need to, they need to be the one that got it right. right. And they can make this claim without any evidence. I'm the only one who knows the real Pacham Do. Well, guess what? Yip Man never really took any photos with the Pacham Do. There are only like three photos of Yip Man with the Pacham Do in his hands. All right, one where he's doing the Lok Chi Do and one where he's holding them and one where he's teaching the, the Shaw Brothers actress Lei Koi, Koi On, who is the uh, wife of William Cheung's brother. And he was just teaching her the Pacham That's it. Okay, so there are no, there's no real photographic evidence of, you know, oh, there's one uh, where he's doing the gap though, right? But there's very, very rare photos. There's no video, even the Tang Tang video, he did the Siu Nam Tao, he did the Chum Kyu, he did not do Buji, he did the wooden dummy, and he did the pole. So we don't even have his Buji form on video, and we don't have his knife. So when someone says, oh, I have the most authentic Ba Cham Do because my Sivu really learned it, whatever. Even if your Sivu really learned it from Yip Man, your Sivu is teaching you what he understood from Yip Man. But you cannot say this is Yip Man's Pacham Do. The only one who could say that was Yip Man. All right? And, and, and the, even I, I know the learned thing Pacham Do, but I would never tell someone, oh, you know, uh, uh, I'm teaching you exactly like learned thing. I'm not learned thing. I'm teaching you what I understood from what I learned from my teachers. That's all. And Yip Man was only teaching what he understood from his teachers. As much as people think, that it can be exactly the same. It cannot. All right? Name any two students of Yip Man who learn from Yip Man who move the same way. You won't find any. And that's the way it should be. And Chen Sifu was, a, was someone who really made me understand that because his Kung Fu is different from Leung Teng's, but not in the theory, not in the idea. It was the same. Maybe his stance was a little different. Maybe his focus was a little bit different. But when he would explain Wing Chun, like he would say, uh, Yip Man would say, you know, Wing Chun is like a cat and this is the mouse. All right, and then when the mouse comes to goes the, the cat just boom, it goes all at once. It doesn't show out a little bit, and then the mouse gets scared and runs away. The cat waits boom, like this. And this is another way of explaining what you would say in learning the magnetic zone. All right, but it's the same thing. It's a different explanation, different idea, but it's the same kung fu. But it's expressed differently by different masters of the system. And these people are saying, oh, they do it the most authentic. They do it exactly the way Yip Man did. I can, most of these people who say they do it in the most authentic way, I can show you a photo of Yip Man where he's doing it differently than they do. It's like people need to stop pretending that there's 
safety in saying, oh, I'm the one who does it like that. Well, if I punch you in the face, can you stop me from punching you in the face? Or are you gonna tell me, hey, look at my stance. It's just like Yip Man's. Yeah, I'll still punch you in the face. Either you can do it or you can't, yeah. all right? And, and this is the conversation Wing Chun needs to have. And these were the conversations I would have with Chan Sifu. He, 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 the last thing I'll say before we go on to the next question is he said, um, oh, people are criticizing Wing Chun now. They say oh, Wing Chun has no power. He goes, back in the day, we used to train the wall bag all the time. We used to hit the wall bag. We used to practice chi sa with power. We had power. He says, it's not that Wing Chun has power. It's that the new generation is too lazy to train it and they don't have power. And uh, yeah, that always stuck with me, right? Because at the end of the day, it's not the technique. It's the Kung Fu. Right. It's how much effort and training and hard work you put into it. So um, yeah. Fascinating. Right. Fascinating, so, yeah. I had a quick question for you though mm -hmm. about you and you saying about with the knife form and you were actually able to see the intersection. Yes. Right? At least I believe that's what I'm seeing. Okay. Well, yeah. let's say you believe that's yes. what you're yeah, yeah, saying. Yeah. I mean, as I am not anywhere close to the knife form personally, mm -hmm. although I do intend to learn it one day in yes. the future. Yes. Like going back to stuff you said in previous podcasts, I would imagine, could you give a kind of idea of like how that might have possibly changed in comparison to maybe what was going on at the time in fighting, bearing in mind that obviously when we're doing Wing Chun mm -hmm. back in those days, it's to fight Choi Le fat people, but now, you know, if I'm doing Wing Chun. Yes, well, I mean, well, the knives are a little bit different because the knives are specifically designed to fight against other types of weapons. Oh, yes, of All course, right? yes, yes, I did actually forget that. Yeah, no, that's okay. Um, that's why I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so um, what's interesting about the earlier version of the knife form is that the footwork borrows liberally from the pole form. Oh. So when you look at like the earlier versions of the knife form, whether you're looking at maybe a Choi Shung Teen's version or a Wong Sun Lung's version or a Chen Chi Man's version, uh, you see horse stance and you see front stance. And these are two stances that are incorporated in the Lok Tim Bun Guan. Um, it seems that over time, Ip Man... Like, so I believe that in the early, and I've got, I'm not making any claim. It's like, so, so the thing is, I am fully willing to be corrected on this. The problem is that there is just a dearth of actual research materials on this, right? I mean, like what, where, where you know, we can only go on what a Sivu does and he claims this is what he has learned from Yip Man, okay? Right. So we, to a certain degree, you have to take it on face value, but that's why I also think you can't just listen to one. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you look at Choi Shung Tin's knife form, it, it has some things that are very similar to Wong Sun Lung's or Chen, Chen Chi Man's, but also has things that are really different. So if you look at the two of them, you'd be like, eh, what's going on here, right? But then you look at like a couple other ones, and then you start to say, oh, okay, well, I see maybe this a little bit like this, a little bit like that. So you have to kind of look at all of them and start taking the average of all of it because it's really easy to go, well, you know, in, 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 in this guy, he does the gapto in the first section, but in the other uh, form, the gapto is in the, the third section, right? Those are not important differences. Yeah. The, the, they both have gapto, all right, gapto. They both have this movement, right, the clamping knives. It's just that one guy learned it in this first set, the other guy learned it in the third set or whatever. Those are not things that are like, Oh, it's in a different set. How Look how inauthentic it is. They both have the same thing, right? But these are things that get a lot of Wing Chun guys' panties in a twist. Oh, God, look at it. He's not even doing it in the right set. Are you freaking kidding me? Shut up. All right, shut up. All right? Uh, mm -hmm. so, you, so you look at the main movements, and what I do is I, I've looked at all of those early period knife forms. Right. And I kind of like, I look at what is the common denominator between all of them, because maybe some of them only learn part of it. Yeah. And some of it, some people borrowed from others. So you're gonna see there's a lot of borrowing in Kung Fu, whether people want to admit it or not. Even if someone learned everything from their Sifu, well, they also go to their Sihing and be like, uh, hey, uh, how do you do this, right? It's not, but that's the way it should be. Yeah. Right? We should be taking all the information we got and checking it with, hey, what am I, did my Sihing learn it the same way? Or maybe my Sihing Sifu showed him something a little bit differently, not because he's hiding something, maybe he just forgot, or maybe five years ago he emphasized this movement, but now he emphasizes this movement. So you have to look at the averages. And so there's definitely like a style of Pacham Do of the 50s and early 60s. Lots of horse stance, side on, front stance. 
And then it seems into the 60s and into the later 60s, the footwork became more and more like the regular Wing Chun footwork, perhaps right. with a slightly wider stance, mm -hmm. slightly offset maybe. But it became more the general rear-weighted style. There was, like, for example, the Chan Chi Man version I learned has a liberal use of the horse stance and the front stance. And it has some Wing Chun foot, like some normally recognizable Wing Chun footwork in there, like turns and some steps. But it has front stance and horse stance. The Leung Teng knife form has no horse stance, no front stance. It's all the Sam Gop, all the triangle step. It's just a modification of the Wing Chun normal steps and also regular Wing Chun steps. Right. So it's all in there. So, um, and it seems that that was the evolution over time. It's not to say one is better than the other, but it just seems really, really clear. Um, it could also be that as Yip Man got older, he wasn't as comfortable going into horse stances. All right. So, I mean, they could all, so the thing is like, I'm not saying like, oh, it got better because I learned the Leung Ting version. And of course that version has got to be better. I, it's like, we just have to look at it like scientists and investigators. All right. Yeah. Um, he might've thought it, it, it was a better way to do it. It also just might've been that he got older and didn't want to squat down when he's holding the knives. Okay. So, I mean, the thing is that we, we have to take our own biases out of it. Okay. I, I'm a former Leung Ting student and you talk to most Leung Ting guys and it's like, oh, the way we learned it is the best and everyone else, you know, he was the closed door student, da, da, da. But then, and then the other people go, eh, yeah, they're always saying they're the best. But the thing is behind closed doors, your lineage is also saying they're the best. All right. Uh, t tell me, uh, show me a Moyat guy that doesn't secretly think that they have the most traditional, authentic version of, of Yip Man's art. Okay. <laughs> all right. I, I, you, you, there's three of them and I know them. All right. The rest of them are a little uppity about how traditional their style is, right? Um, but the same can be said about almost all of them, all right? Yeah. What they say publicly and what they say behind closed doors, what they say behind closed doors is almost all the same. They all, all sound the same, all right? Uh, they're just a few outliers, right? And a few people who just really cared about the function. That's another reason why I really respect Wong Sun Lang, because he was definitely above the fray, in my opinion, as far as that goes. And right. he wasn't afraid to modify the form or do things a little bit differently based on his fighting experience, right? Which other people have done too, but they won't admit it. They won't admit that they changed the form because then, oh, you're not doing something traditional, but maybe they found something didn't quite work right and they had to fix it. Well, you wait until the old man is dead and then you say, yeah, this is how he showed me. And it's like your modification. Just say, hey, look, this is how I learned it from my Sifu, but in my application, I can't make it work like this. I have to do it this way instead. That is a very honest answer. Yeah. All right. But what you don't do is go like, oh, this is how Sifu showed it to me. <laughs> no one was looking. All right. Because very traditional Sifus have a very difficult time admitting that they change stuff themselves. Right. But spoiler alert, everyone has changed it. Do you think Yip Man didn't change the forms from what he learned from Chan Ma Shun? You can go and see, in, you can go to mainland China and go to Fatsan and see people who come from the lineage of Yip Man Sifu. And you can look at their forms, okay? And it's not exactly the same as Yip Man, okay? And that is totally fine. We are, the, 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 the one problem with the, the, the way Chinese culture looks at these things is that, it's traditional, and the first way was the best way. And I have all this secret thing, and now I pass it to you the exact way I got it. You take this thing, and now you pass it exact same way to your. That doesn't work in in real life. Not with maybe with a tai chi form. Okay, maybe you can do the tai chi moves the exact same way your sifu did, but with wing chun, which is living and breathing and dynamic, you cannot because you have you. We're not talking about how you play the siunam tao form. We're talking about someone is trying to punch you in the face. Can you stop that guy from punching you in the face? And now it's not 1950s Hong Kong. If, if you're out on the street now and someone attacks you, you're not going to be facing someone from Choi Dei Fat. You're not going to be facing someone from Zhao Ga Tong Long, right? Or Bak Mei or any of those styles. You're going to face someone maybe who doesn't know any martial arts, but that doesn't mean that they're less dangerous. A pissed off person who just comes swinging wildly at you is equally, if not more dangerous than someone who knows something specifically. Some, you know, there's a saying in Chinese, Man kun da se lo sifu, the wild fist that kills the sifu. All right? Because the sifu expects the person to come at them with, mm -hmm. and the guy ah, just goes like this and kills the sifu, right? Okay? So the thing is that 
if I want to teach my students how to defend themselves, I cannot just say, okay, you're only going to fight someone who's a boxer or only going to fight a jujitsu guy or only going to fight a Charlie Fudd guy. You're going to fight someone who's just going to run into you, who's going to cover up and press into you and push you and try to grab your head and put you in a headlock and hit you like this. That's the reality of combat. And those were not all questions that they were asking in 1950s and 1960s Hong Kong. It was, okay, uh, Sivu, if I face the Choi De Fat guy and he uses this movement here, how can I fight against it? Oh, okay, well, you need to do this, 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 and this, okay? This is not a problem nowadays. If a, if a Wing Chun guy meets a Choi De Fat guy, they go, hey, you do Kung Fu too? Awesome, cool, let's go have a beer, all right? No one goes, ah, 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 right? Because Kung Fu has become smaller and, and, and more kind of contained, and, mm-hmm. and we're no longer fighting against each other as much as we used to. We now have to, to make Kung Fu relevant. We have to practice fighting against the other guys, right? So that is the evolution. So simply with Wing Chun being a flexible martial art that has to adapt to the current times, it is impossible to continue to do it the way we did it in the 1950s. We can do the same drills, we can do the same forms, but if we're teaching application, can you really, in 2023, just do like many Wing Chun schools do, their partner stands like this and goes in with a, a Wing Chun punch with low elbow? Do you know how many Wing Chun schools still now, now it's okay, it's one thing if you're doing Chi Sao or Go Sao, but do you know how many Wing Chun schools I see where when they teach fighting application, the bad guy has their hands in a Wing Chun Chong Sao? You're wow. going to fight a Wing Chun guy out on the street? Mm-hmm. And then what does the Wing Chun guy do? Comes without setting it up with a hand control or a feint or anything, just steps in with a low level punch, a low elbow punch. And then the Wing Chun does all this stuff. And it's like, Bro, if someone attacked me like a Wing Chun person, I would take my hand, I would pull it back here, and I would slap him across his face because I don't need Wing Chun to defend someone attacking me with a low elbow punch from half a mile away. (laughs) Are you kidding me? Without setting it up from that far away, just coming in with a narrow punch? Mm -hmm. That... Why do we punch with our elbow low? Because we're suppressing our opponent's arm. You don't suppress your opponent's arm from a mile away. You gotta get in close. And if you attack someone like this, I would just double up, do some WWE wrestling move on them or whatever, right? But you see all these guys, they're standing there, their guy's standing across from them, steps in with a low elbow punch, and then is that the attack that you're worried about? Now, don't get me wrong. If you're drilling basics, look, we also teach, okay, I mean, Chi Sao, I give you a low elbow attack, you do Bong Pak, you have to learn these things. You have to learn Wing Chun versus Wing Chun because you have to understand how the art functions. But then you have to say, okay, guys, now we're going to put gloves on and now your partner is going to take his fist, hold it up here and smash it in your face like anyone else would on the street, not come at you with a dinky low elbow punch from half a mile away or just a straight kick to your knee. These are our tools we use in a certain context. These are not the things we're attacked with. And that is how the art will survive, is if we teach the students how to defend themselves against a modern threat. And Wing Chun is a very intelligent martial art, but it's being trained in a very stupid way by so many people. Right. Assuming, no wonder when these, these guys in China, they fight against Xu Xiaodong, who's a real MMA fighter, and they don't have any experience using Wing Chun for, they go, what the hell do you think is going to happen? Mm-hmm. All right? And the headline should not be Xu Xiaodong destroys a Wing Chun guy. It should be semi-professional fighter defeats rank amateur with delusions of their skill. Yeah. That is the actual headline. Mm-hmm. It's not Wing Chun. Yeah. Ding Hao, the number four Wing Chun fighter in Hong Kong. Oh, oh, that's one thing you'll see when we fly into Hong Kong, when you're in the airport, there's a leaderboard in the Hong Kong airport that shows you the top Wing Chun fighters. And then you will see Ding Hao went from number four. He's about number seven right now. What the f*** is the number four Wing Chun fighter in Hong Kong? I've been there 27 times. I've never seen someone go like, oh, uh, this guy is now the number two Wing Chun fighter. What the, what, what ranking system is this? Also, in mainland China, they want to build up Xu Xiaodong. So they, they can't say he's the number one fighter from Hong Kong because everyone would be like, who the hell is that guy? They can't say he's number two or number three. So when the promoters in China want to show Xu Xiaodong beats the guy from Hong Kong, they say... He's the number four of best fighter in Wing Chun from Hong Kong. And I go, I've never heard of Ding Hao before. Sorry. Except he didn't actually win. It was a draw. That fight? Yep. Really? Yeah. I, I, I turned it off after I saw him getting pummeled. No, it was a draw. Really? Yeah. Because, yeah. because the whole thing is that mainland China 
aren't building up Zhu Xiaodong because they're upset with him. Yeah, they are upset with him. I, I say he's building up himself. Yeah, he's building up and, himself. And the yeah, and it, it definitely, and mainland China is actually a bit upset with him because yeah. they feel like he's disgracing Chinese kung fu. I, 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 on one hand, think he's actually doing a good job because if some Tai Chi guy really thinks he can fight an MMA guy without knowing mixed martial arts, like they're, I, they're Tai Chi guys and they're internal guys who also practice wrestling and who also do mixed martial arts and they can integrate a lot of the stuff that they do, the internal stuff, borrowing force, using it against it, but they integrate it into the whole of their mixed martial arts. It's like mixed martial arts with a little bit of Bagua flavor yeah. or mixed martial arts with a little bit of Tai Chi flavor, but it's still mixed martial arts. And those guys know how to hit pads and they know how to wrestle and they know how to pummel. Okay, that's something else. But you go in there raw, only knowing the traditional martial art, um, I'm happy if Xu Xiaodong beats the shit out of those guys. Yeah, of course, cool. uh, absolutely. I, I, I'm, I'm all for that. I yeah. didn't realize that fight with the draw, because quite as when I started watching it, <laughs> he was getting like trounced right from the beginning. I go, okay, I'm done. Like, I know. I knew what was going to happen. The moment he stood there in the narrow Zhong cell in front of him, like immobile, I'm like, oh God, he's already, he's done. It just hasn't happened yet. Yeah, no, he, he I mean, I watched it and like basically the referee was desperately trying to help Ding Hao beat Zhu Xiaodong, right? And every time Zhu Xiaodong knocked him on his ass and was just pummeling him, <laughs> the referee would like break it up and Ding freaking Hao get up and just be like, yeah, and then just, with his like weird like kind of you know sifu shuffle yes right yes, because yes. of course was, like, he was wearing like some silky pajama top too, yeah right? because of that because that's the other thing it's like the sifu shuffle you tell us about in class yes when we're training he was actually doing in the fight as opposed to yeah. you know yeah, well you yeah. saw enough of it yes right of you know what i mean and at the end of it when it's massively clear who wins it was a draw what a sham. What a yeah, bunch of bullshit. Because they couldn't have it. They couldn't have it that Xu Xiaodong yeah, won. Yeah, yeah. Right? But, you know, someone actually asked me about that about two or three days ago, actually. And yes. they were like, because they're like, so what, what do you train? I was like, oh, Wing Chun. They're like, oh, yeah. So, you know, I heard about like there was like that fight with that number four guy. And I was like, <laughs> that number four guy. Yeah, I was just well, first like, of all, it's, okay. kind of, it's kind of weird anyway. Like, oh, you do Wing Chun. Oh, yeah, there was that one fight or whatever. It's like, because um, you, you, you could level that against any style. Mm -hmm. The Brazilian jiu-jitsu sucks because Hoist Gracie lost to Matt Hughes. Yeah. All right. Actually, that was really fun. I don't know. If, did, you, did, you ever, did you ever see that fight? No, I never saw that fight. Okay, so you know Hoist it. Gracie, obviously legend of yeah. early UFCs, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. Uh, I've met him before, and he, he was... Well, I, I've met a, a few of the Gracie guys. Uh, Hoist was... I would say he's, he's, he's got a little... Interest, he's got an interesting demeanor. He's a little standoffish for no reason. But yeah. it's like... Dude, if you're that badass, like, you, you know, like, you, you could be a little easy go. Because a lot of my other jujitsu friends are so easy going. Yeah. And even other UFC fighters, like, very easy going. And he was, like, a very, like, a little, mm, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I told him I knew Ron Van Cleef, who had, he had defeated in early UFC. He's like, oh, God, I'm so sorry. And, and I was like, huh? Like, bro, you beat him, like, 100 years ago. And he's doing Brazilian jiu-jitsu now. And he's super cool. And you're salty? <laughs> yeah, it was like a weird thing. I was like, "Oh, yeah." It was like, "Nice to meet you, Hoy." It's like, oh, "I'm good friends with Ron Van Cleve," and he's like, "Oh, oh, sorry to hear that." That was very weird. No, it was very weird. It was like, it's very weird. yeah, it was kind of like, "Take it easy, bro." Like, mm -hmm. you know, like I don't know. Like, I'm not, I'm not gonna try to take you down or anything, but I'd be like, you know, <laughs> uh, it's, it, it was just this wasn't. I, it, uh, can you imagine beating someone? 20, 30 years ago, and then someone's like, "Oh, I'm friends with that guy," and that guy's like still totally cool, and you're like, "Yeah." Yeah, it's so weird. Yeah, it was, I would understand if they had a draw or maybe that guy beat you or whatever. Maybe you're still salty about it. Maybe you didn't feel you lost that fight. But yeah, I thought it was like a little weird. Um, but uh, anyway, I totally forgot what I was talking about. Yeah, um, um, yeah. well, we would, yeah, me too. Actually. No, we were going off on a tangent about Xu Xiaodong, right? Yes, oh, yeah, did. no, no, I was saying, okay, I was talking about the Matt Hughes thing, right? Yes, that's so, right. So, you know, Hoist won all those early ones. And then I think in the mid-2000s, he wanted to make a comeback to UFC to fight Matt Hughes, who at that time was the former, I believe he was already the former welterweight champion because GSP was already the welterweight champion. And then right. he wanted to go in there and then fight him. And Matt Hughes trounced him and ended up arm locking him and... and <sighs> And then, so you're going to say like, oh yeah, oh, you do Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Yeah. Do you see that one fight where Matt Hughes beat Hoist Gracie? Like, yeah, Brazilian jiu-jitsu? Like, it's, it's kind of weird. Like, and I'm not saying like Wing Chun has a great record in mixed martial arts because most Wing Chun people are not professional fighters. Mm -hmm. But it's just kind of funny, like this kind of like, you heard this one thing and then like, oh yeah, you know, and, and, but by the way, it, it's very funny how they spun that. 
Yeah. Uh, I remember when uh, Hoist lost that fight and Henner, uh, you know, who's from the Gracie family, uh, he made a video like the next day. He's like, uh, the loss for Hoist was a win for Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. You know why? Because Matt Hughes beat Hoist with a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu technique, which would not have been introduced if not for Hoist Gracie in those uh, early UFCs. I and I was that. like, well played, well sir. Played. Well played. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. If, if you ever have a PR crisis, I think it would be worth the money to pay Henner Gracie to spin it for you. It's like the, <laughs> that, that is like, that is some real high level spin right there. Yeah, that was amazing. So before we get out of here, I think we have one more question. So we have a bunch of questions for Patreon. Yes, but we do. one thing I have to say is, I really like the quality of the questions from our Patreon supporters, which is why, even though I didn't just exclusively speak of Chanchi Man, they're really good jump off points for talking. So I think we have mm -hmm. one more. Yep. And uh, and then on our next one, we'll get to some of our other Patreon. Absolutely. Questions. Okay, cool. All right, then. Well, that was fascinating. So if you're not local to NYC, one of the easiest ways for you to improve your Wing Chun training is to train online with me. Online private training is tailored toward the individual and geared towards serious practitioners who want to improve their skills or knowledge base. I offer two private lesson subscriptions, twice a month and four times a month. Kung Fu Genius listeners use the code KFG online to get one online consultation lesson free with the purchase of any subscription. That code and the links are in the description below. Online private training is a convenient way for you to ask any of the questions you've had about application, form, theory, or even how to teach. Bring a partner to train with you online at absolutely no extra cost. I'll show you how to train with your partner online. Again, use the code KFG online to get a free consultation lesson with the purchase of any online subscription. Links are in the description below, and I'll see you online. Um, uh, Leif, Leif Lund. Hi, Sifu Alex. Here comes greetings from Leif Lund, a.k.a. KFR, the Kung Fu Rookie. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. With a big thanks for the intense training week in Florida. Oh, nice. Yeah, he, he did uh, my intensive course. So he came down, I think, I believe he's from Sweden. Mm -hmm. And he came down to Florida and it was his first time in the States. And I was like, your first time in the States and you came to Orlando, Florida. <laughs> like, just, just so you know, th this is not America. This is something else here. All right. <laughs> uh, and yeah, he did the he did the week long course with me. And yeah, he's he's more or less a Wing Chun beginner. So we did we did lots of basic stuff. Oh, wow. Yeah. I mean, and, that's a good and, way to start. And he's coming to Hong Kong. He's coming on the Hong Kong trip. Ooh, yes, excellent. Yes, yes, yes. That's going to be cool. I get to meet someone else. Yep. Super nice. Excellent. Maybe we'll talk about. It's from Sweden. Maybe we'll talk about death metal. You never know. Death metal. Yeah. Sorry. Wow. Yeah. Thrash metal, math metal. No, he, metal. no, no, uh, Mikey, um, Mr. Lund is Dr. Lund. He's like a serious person. Serious people like math metal. N no, 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 no. He's like a, he's like a professional. All right. Like he's like a real serious dude. Those people are professional musicians like Antonio. They just have. Antonio is a world famous jazz musician. All right. Trash metal, what do you call it? meth metal, whatever? Like I could, I could pick that up in two months. All right, let's let's be real here. Ooh. All right. <laughs> do you think it's easy doing what Antonio does with a saxophone? I don't think it's easy all right. at all. All right. I think it's a lot easier to make death metal. Anyway, <clears throat> I have a question that may be basic, but I ask it because the basics are often the most important to learn and I am absolutely convinced that you can, as always, give a detailed answer that may help more people than me. By nature, we all has different bodies. Sorry, I'm actually reading this verbatim. So, um, i.e. height, weight, and mobility in muscles and joints. But the basic instruction is still the same when taking the stance in Sunim Tao. This means depending on the body constitution that not everyone may end up in an optimally stable position. The angle of rotation of the feet differs from person to person. The legs end up with different distance from each other. And because of this, the bodily posture and the stability can suffer. For example, if you are tall and under mobile or short and hypermobile, the end result can look quite comical, which is neither stable nor functional. It is said that practice makes perfect, but there is also another expression, what you practice, you get better at. It is then sad if you overtime train something that does not really work. My question then is whether there is more generalized targeted individual advice like a rule of thumb based on one's personal bodily conditions when taking a good position in the stance. Yes. Finally, I would like to thank you for an extremely good and entertaining podcast with your invaluable insights and knowledge combined with a good portion of humor and interaction with 
in in uh, inverted commas the sidekicks no matter who it is thank you <laughs> a shout out to all of you thank you thank, thank you thank you, you. uh sidekicks, yes yes no it's always it's always <laughs> difficult uh when when you teach someone like you give them an intro to Wing Chun for a week and then they're gone. Yeah. Because you know it's like, oh, I gave you just enough to get started, but not enough to like, you know, you have to always do more and then they're good training always leads to more questions, right? Um yeah, so uh he, he uh makes a very good point. Uh, and this kind of bounces off what we just talked about in terms of people really claiming how traditional they are. They're like some very traditional sifus that are like, no, the exact shape of your stance has to look exactly like this because it has to look exactly the same way the sifu does it. And I often find that people who are so bent on getting everything to look exactly the same way they do it or their sifu does it, uh, it sometimes kind of shows a little bit of insecurity in their own technique because for example, in the Wing Chun advancing stance, we have the front foot turned in. You know, I mean, there are variations among the different lineages, but for the most part, your front foot is turned in to protect your groin, okay? That's a function, all right? But there are people who get uppity about like the exact distance between the two feet because it has to look exactly the way Sivu does it. And, um, and then what happens is they are prioritizing copying someone else's body mechanics which may not match yours and they're making that the priority over say the function of the foot being turned in so you just don't get kicked in the nuts all right yeah. so the idea is that um we try as much as possible to get the students to do it according to let's say a standard template that looks somewhat in the flavor of our style or lineage but a good instructor also has to be able to adapt it to different body types. We've, we've brought up this example multiple times. I have a student, Tom, who's a former professional bodybuilder, and he's still yoked, all right? <laughs> and uh, Tom doesn't have the same mobility as some other students. His shoulders are two basketballs, okay? A and so um, I also have another student. Uh, he's actually gonna come and do a private lesson after uh, our podcast today, who's a power lifter, and he's also a big, strong guy. And he's been told by traditional Wing Chun Sifus that he cannot do Wing Chun because he's too muscle bound or his arms are too strong or his shoulders are too big. Like, no, you can't do it. And he, even one of them said re something ridiculous like, you know, Yip Man lifted weights too once. And then when he stopped lifting weights, that's when he became a master. And so they're stigmatizing. It's like it's gotten so far that some traditional Wing Chun guys literally stigmatize weight training or stigmatize being strong. Because in my opinion, sometimes when a big strong guy comes into their gym, they go, ugh, what am I gonna do with this guy? You're gonna teach him Wing Chun because the guy wants to learn Wing Chun. He's not your opponent, he's your student. This whole idea of looking at someone who comes into your school who's big and yoked and going, Ugh. Why, why are you afraid? You're the teacher. Do you, do you know your stuff? Then you should be able to show it. And is that guy coming in there to fight you or is that guy coming in there to learn something? So your job as the Sivu is to modify it according to their body type. So for example, to use Tom. Tom's shoulders are so muscle bound. He cannot do the kapjang from Buji. So when his elbow gets pinned, he cannot ride out with a kapjang to escape. So I have to teach him how to stick with a bong and take a, take a step. So I had to find a modification for him. I can't just say, oh, you can't do cup jang, you can't do Wing Chun. Because what kind of teacher would I be if I didn't find a workaround? Wing Chun, like any other martial art, is high level problem solving. There's a problem, in our case, the problem of violence. And so we need to figure out how to solve it using certain ideas. Oh, but this person can't move this way. Oh, well, there's no solution for you. What? What, what Sivu is such an asshole to actually be that way, right? Well, apparently a lot of them, all right? And I think maybe there's a lack of understanding about body mechanics and maybe a lack of practice. Because if you've practiced these things when your students are pressing you and you have different training partners, you learn how to get out of different situations using this stuff in ways that maybe weren't exactly the way you were shown, but they function because you're following the principles. So if you follow the same problem-solving strategy, you can look at someone with a different body type or maybe in, in this case, mobile limitations, like the hips don't move a certain way, the ankles don't move a certain way, and you find a workaround. 
and you go, okay, well, maybe you can't step exactly this way here, so we're going to have to like change it a little bit for you this way, or we're gonna have to like, maybe you have to stand a little bit wider because you don't quite have the balance to do it this way, or maybe we have to change your foot ankle or foot angle because your ankle doesn't move or whatever. Those are natural uh, adaptations that any good instructor will find over time. When you see a student after the course of a couple months, you go, okay, um, I really see that the student can't do it this way. We're gonna have to modify it a little bit for them. We're gonna have to change it a little bit. And also the difference in styles and temperaments is always there. Marlon, for example, one of our assistant instructors here, will never move the way Tom does. And Tom will never move the way Marlon does. Mar they're the two opposite, you know, Tom is like, a short bodybuilder Cuban, all right? And Marlon is like tall and lanky and very thin. Both of them are the same level in Wing Chun. Uh, they're learning the BUG curriculum and both of them apply it in their own different ways, but they're still following the same ideas that I teach. And it doesn't look exactly the same and I'm thankful for that. So um, I think the, the rule of thumb that he's asking me for here is this. Uh, Yes, there's a certain body shape and position that we want to be in because there's a, let's say, part of it is some, it is a style. There's a stylistic adherence, how we move the same way. A karate man moves in a certain way and uh, uh, a, a Thai boxer has a certain style and shape as to how they do things. And jujitsu people or wrestlers have a certain style and shape. But you will see that within those different styles, there's a lot of variation. But in traditional Kung Fu styles, the idea of doing things a little bit differently to adapt your body type is in some lineages and in some instances shat upon. Oh, because if you do it a little bit differently, you're breaking tradition or you didn't learn something right. Well, what do you do with someone whose shoulders are not mobile? You tell them, oh, you can't do Wing Chun? And then, you know, it becomes this elitist thing only for people who have the right mobility and the right body type? Or are you gonna find a workaround? Or are you gonna find some other way that they can defend it? and give them something instead of just saying they can't do it. When you become a Sifu, your job is not just to teach, it's also to inspire and it's to help. And to tell people like, no, you can't do it. It's like, because there's always this thing in Chinese Kung Fu of like, yeah, well, maybe you'll learn it, maybe you won't, maybe I'll teach it to you, maybe if you stick around enough, you'll get this, or I'll teach you this version, but maybe not, like that stuff needs to go away. We need to look at the individual student, look at their body mechanics, look at their temperament, and find the way to get the function of Wing Chun to work for their body type. Maybe they can't stand on one track because of a hip problem. Then we need to prioritize that foot turned in to protect their groin and say, okay, well, since you can't stand on one track when you step in, you wanna make sure that you place your feet and your legs in a position where it's hard for someone to kick you in the groin because your stance won't be able to do it by itself because you don't have the knee, ankle, hip mobility to get into the stance. So then let's work on getting you into a position relative to your opponent so they can't kick you instead of just relying on the stance by itself. Right. And that's a workaround. And I think that maybe some instructors don't realize that it's their job to teach the students the function of Wing Chun, not just to make them cookie cutter carbon copies of their Sifu, which they themselves are also not. All right. But they pretend they are and they put this burden on their own students. Um, so yeah, you have to kind of, over time, feel it a little bit. Of course, this is much easier to do with an instructor there who can guide you because when you don't have an instructor, which is the case here, he came down to Florida, he learned from me for a week. I, I taught him enough basics to confuse him for the rest of his life. Uh, and, and now he's presumably without guidance until he sees me in Hong Kong in a couple weeks. Uh, and um, you know, then I can give him some tips. Okay, remember we were working on this. Okay, now I want you to do it a little bit more this way or now we can expand it. Um, without an instructor, it becomes a little bit more difficult, but ultimately, you have to find a way to adapt the movements to your own body type and figure out a way that works and listen to what your Sifu says. The most important thing is not copying the way the technique looks. It's important to learn the function of the technique and learning how to make that function work for you. You can have a perfectly shaped bong sao that doesn't work at all if you don't understand how bong sao functions. You can throw the shape, and if you do it incorrectly, bong sao is just a ramp to your face, okay? But if you understand the function of bong sao, that will never happen. So uh, you need to make sure you have an instructor who teaches function. 
You need to make sure you understand the function and then you have to adapt that according to your body type. And that's all I gotta say about that. All right, everyone. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Kung Fu Genius. As always, don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius. Hit that bell for notifications. And if you have any topic ideas you want me or the boys to talk about on a future episode, go ahead and put that in the comments below. And as always, I'll see you guys next time. Word is I'm a Kung Fu Genius. Technique speaks for me, not lineage. Forget Jet Li, cause I'm the one. Many call me Sifu, but to you I'm Si Kung, and I produce masters. You surpass us, your Kung Fu stiffer than corpse and caskets. City Wing Chung is the house I built. Violate the gate and your blood gets spilt. Alex Richter, always the victor. Do you wanna... Jesus, that was loud, <laughs> holy shit. A lot louder than I expected, sorry. <laughs> I can't hear anything. It was a mistake. Huh? I, I, I apologize. Huh? I apologize. Huh? <laughs>